So welcome to FACT's webinar called Livestock Guardian Animal Overview, Llamas, Donkeys, and Dogs. Our presenter is Jan Doner. This webinar is hosted by Food Animal Concerns Trust. I am Larissa McKenna, FACT's Humane Farming Program Director, and I will be moderating the webinar this evening. Thank you all for joining us. So to begin with just a few introductions, FACT is a national nonprofit organization that is headquartered in Illinois. We promote the safe and humane production of meat, milk, and eggs. I direct FACT's Humane Farming Program, which provides a number of opportunities for livestock and poultry farmers. And this webinar is part of our Humane Farming webinar series. So please visit our website to learn more about our other farmer services, including upcoming webinars and our Fund to Farmer grants. We are currently accepting grant applications. At this time, I'm delighted to introduce our esteemed presenter, Jan Donard. Jan is an author, educator, and researcher who lives on her small family farm in Michigan. Jan has over 40 years of experience, hands-on experience, using uh, Livestock Guardians for predator control. She's the author of several books, including Livestock Guardians, Using Dogs, Donkeys and Llamas to Protect Your Herd, and the Encyclopedia of Animal Predators. We are incredibly lucky to have Jan with us today to share her experience and expertise, and she's going to be available to answer your questions later on in the webinar. So with that, I'm going to let Jan get started with her presentation. Jan, please take it away. Thanks, Larissa, and I uh, want to thank everybody who's here this evening, and I also want to thank FACT for sponsoring these, really. I think the set of uh, webinars that you have in your archive are incredibly valuable, and I hope people take a chance to check them out. Um, I'm really hoping this is going to be beneficial for folks exploring the idea of livestock guardians. And if you already have one, maybe you'll add some more information to your, your knowledge bank, because I really think that we are all we are all educators in this. We all learn slightly different things on our farm with our animals in different parts of the country or the world, and and we often find ourselves trying to help friends or neighbors or fellow farmers or something. So I'm hoping that you'll take things in and be able to share them with others as well. Um, I got my first livestock guard dog in 1979, and that was the very early days of using LGDs here in North America. And I made lots of mistakes with that dog. I <laughs> happy to say. Um, and I'm still learning. I learn something frequently from somebody I've talked to or a different situation. And I think we're all learning. This is very much a hands-on skill and a farmer-based skill that we have to, um, you know, just bring into our um, lives and, and um, you know, work at being successful with over the long term. So a brief overview of what we're going to try to handle tonight. We're going to talk about um, how they work and, and more importantly, why they work. Um, we're going to talk about the pros and cons of each type of livestock guardian. And I'm going to talk about how to select, make your selection of an animal um, to offer you the best chance of success. Um, I'm going to give you just a very brief overview of their basic care, things like health or, or other issues like feeding or housing or something, primarily just enough to sort of help you make your decision or to compare one livestock guardian animal with another one. And finally, we're just going to we'll give you some basic information about bringing your livestock guardian home the first few days or weeks and some very early problem solving. Um, with livestock guard dogs in particular, it's a huge topic. And that's why we're having two more presentations that are going to focus just on livestock guard dogs. And I know a lot of people had questions even when they were signing up for the webinar. And some of them I'll be able to answer tonight, but a lot of them were a little bit more specific about the dogs. And I will make sure that we cover those in the next couple webinars. Um, I'm always generalizing here. I know there are always exceptions to what I say. <laughs> My whole purpose has always been to give folks the best chance for success. And to do that, sometimes you do have to just generalize and, said, and say, in general, this works. It's true you might have an exception, and I understand that, but I'm just trying to give people the best chance for success. So what is a livestock guardian? I want to pause for a, just a really brief little history lesson to sort of explain how we got here. Um, the use of livestock guardian dogs is very ancient, and it's a a response to predation from 
early, early times. Um, and we re rediscovered it in North America just since the 1980s. And part of that was because the immigrants and colonists that came to North America did not have experience with the use of livestock guardian dogs for m in most situations. Um, in Britain and Ireland and much of Western Europe, the large predators had been um, either driven to extinction or driven into very remote areas or up high in the mountains. And most people didn't have the need for livestock guardians. They weren't used in Britain and Ireland, for example. So when the colonists came here and they were confronted with large predators, their first response was to do what they had done in Europe, which was to try to get rid of them. Um, unfortunately, something that we discovered here in our ecosystem was as we were reducing the numbers of wolves and mountain lions and bears, it allowed the coyote, which had been confined to really a pretty small area in North America, just on the plains and the grasslands, it allowed the coyote to expand everywhere. And we now have far more coyotes all over the continent than we ever had before. Um, with environmental protections in the 1960s and 70s, the large predators also started making a recovery. And that was about the time that farmers and ranchers started turning to the use of livestock guardians to protect their stock and poultry. So while the dogs are really ancient, the use of llamas and donkeys is much more recent. Um, they're actually a form of multi-species grazing in which you have larger animals in with your smaller animals. And they're using a more aggressive animal as protection for your smaller animals. And that, that was a traditional practice. So it comes down to you pretty much have three choices if you're looking for a livestock guardian for your farm. Um, livestock guard dogs are sometimes called livestock protection dogs, or it's frequently shortened to LGD. Undeniably ancient, this is one of the oldest jobs dogs performed for man. They've been very purposefully bred for a combination of traits for guarding and nurturing livestock. Even early Roman writers were very clear about what the purpose and behavior and even a color of a good LGD was. And they even made recommendations on who you should buy your dog from. So this is an ancient practice. Llamas and the their relations, the alpacas, were very rare animals in North America until recently. Only llamas are large enough to serve as livestock guardian. It's, but it's a brand new job for them. They were not used as livestock guardians in their homeland. The deliberate use of donkeys is also recent, although the donkey is a common animal that was often used for multi-species grazing um, in its homelands in Northern Africa and the Middle East. So although llamas and donkeys don't provide the same level of protection as livestock guard dogs, there are good reasons to use them in some situations. So if you're considering the use of a livestock guardian, you really need to do what we're doing this evening. You need to research the advantages and disadvantages of them and then evaluate how they would fit into your own farm situation, your needs and your lifestyle. So they are effective. The use of livestock guard dogs and donkeys has actually doubled since 2004. And both sheep and lamb producers are now have cut in half the predator loss that they've had in the last 20 years. So the, the national agricultural people know that it works. Um, you can be successful with a livestock guardian if you learn how to work, how they work, so you can make the right choice for your situation. And then you sort of have to ignore all these myths and misconceptions that you will definitely hear from other people. They are really widespread, they're well-intentioned, and, I, and I'm, I always forgive people who tell me something like that because we didn't know what we were doing in the beginning. People, um, there had been no st serious study about how to use them and how they worked. And we know a lot more now, but we sort of have to combat this sort of baggage of um, misconceptions that's out there. You also will have a better outcome if you provide a good supportive environment for your animal. And you're un they work the best when they're used in combination with other deterrents. And so we're actually going to get into that later this year when we talk about predator control. Finally, don't commit to getting a livestock guardian unless you actually will enjoy having it on your farm and you have the time to learn some new skills. Um, they're not a magic bullet. They're not a tool that you can just buy and plug in and it's going to work. It's a working partnership with a living creature and they deserve some respect and good care as much as the other animals on your farm.
So guardian llamas, how they work. Um, llamas obviously have been domesticated since pre-Incan times and in their homelands they were just beasts of burden and producers of fiber and meat and they were never used for predator control. They, this, this new job for them was actually discovered here in North America. Um, in the 1980s, a lot of people started keeping fiber sheep and other fiber animals, and some sheep owners noticed that what their losses were lower when a llama was kept in with the flock. And the first research then into how they were working was in the 1990s. So how they work, they're highly social animals, especially if you only have an only llama. They will associate with their pasture mates and they can live with sheep or goats or cattle or alpacas or deer or poultry. They are naturally aggressive towards canines and other predators. In their homeland, their primary predators were foxes and mountain lions, although that's a large predator that's more of a risk. Um, mature llamas will instinctively protect their young, their herd mates, and their territory. And they use behaviors to guard, including their height, and they will often place themselves even on a higher point to look around and some even patrol the grazing area. And then they will sound an alarm. They will posture at a threat. They will charge, kick, or paw. And some individuals will place themselves between the threat and their herd mates. So they're operating about this whole set of instinctual behaviors. Now, advantages of using a llama. It's this socialness that we talked about. They're naturally social and protective, and you're not going to have an extended training period. Um, so they do, in a way, provide some immediate protection because you're buying an adult animal that you don't have to do much with to get it used to living with your animals. Um, they're naturally aggressive towards canines, dogs, foxes, coyotes, bobcats. Um, they're easy to care for. They use similar shelter and food as your stock. They don't tend to challenge fencing. They don't dig under a fence. They can be kept in a pretty small pasture. Um, they're not usually a threat to people. They're most are calm animals. They don't bray like a donkey or bark like a dog, which can be problems with our other guardian animals. And they have a long working lifetime. I often say that they're a good choice for someone who has um, some of these si situations. Um, you have very low predator pressure, maybe just things like foxes. Um, you often bring your stock back to protected paddocks or to the barn at night so they're close to you or your stock is kept close to your house and where people are at. Um, they're a good choice if you have a lot of visitors or maybe a farm business and you're going to have lots of strangers coming to your farm. Um, sometimes they are more easily accepted by stock that is very afraid of dogs. Um, and there's a bonus for people who are into fiber that they get fiber from them as well. But there are also some serious disadvantages. And the biggest one, of course, is um, they are a prey animal, um, especially for large predators or groups of canines. And it's not fair to place them in a situation where they're going to be at great risk. And even one canine can seriously injure a llama. So it's something to consider that they're, they're not going to be capable of handling a really serious threat. Um, they're not protective against some kinds of predators, things like weasels or raccoons or birds of prey, not something they tend to um, alert to. Some individual llamas are not good guardians at all. Just like with all these livestock animals, guardians we're going to talk about, there are always individuals that just don't do quite as well with their job. They are less successful on really large pastures. Um, or some are pasture with really dense vegetation or places where there's a lot of heat and humidity. Um, they um, cannot generally be used with dogs. Some llamas will learn to accept your herding or your pet dog, but many don't. And you don't want to in overly encourage friendliness um, to dogs. Some shepherds do find that they have to like catch and secure the llama before they use their herding dogs. Um, some individuals can be dangerous to humans if they weren't appropriately selected or trained or handled when they were young, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, you should only consider, consider a mature gelded male or a mature, mature female and never an intact male, which would potentially be dangerous to you. Um, there's another thing about llamas that they should not be removed from their peers too early. Um, they learn a lot of their social 
skills by staying with um, other llamas while they're growing up. Um, some people really have trouble with bottle fed llamas being overly pushy and aggressive to people. Um, and if they weren't ever trained or handled, obviously that's going to be a risk as well. The most common issue reported by owners is that they might attempt to breed the stock, sheep in particular, and sometimes they are aggressive over food or something. They do need some specialized care as well, and I'm going to talk about that in a second as well. So how do you select a good guard llama? Research has shown that there are three important traits in a good guard llama, alertness, leadership, and weight or size. And all three of these are linked to age and maturity. Gilded males are the most common. They are larger and they're less expensive. Retired breeding females are also a good choice. At least uh, a llama that's at least 18 to 24 months old and usually just a single llama. So they will want to stay with your stock. Alpacas are too small to be used in North America against predators. Sometimes you will hear about them being used in England or Australia against foxes. But frankly, here in North America, alpaca owners I know are using other livestock guardian animals to protect them. So when you're selecting a guardian, try to see a guardian llama try to see if you can observe this llama with stock look for the llama acting alert see if it will respond to a strange dog if you can bring one carefully um, make sure it's not being aggressive to the stock that it's out in the field with and then of course check to see whether or not it can be handled avoid llamas that are um, being like trying to herd their stock around too much and boss them around, um, if they're trying to protect their food, if they're pacing the fence, or if they're simply not even staying with their stock. If it's an uh, animal that you have not owned before or handled, um, you're going to need to pick up some skills on handling a llama. And often you can ask the you know breeder or seller of the llama if you could have just a few little private lessons here and how to lead one and how to handle and catch it on your own. Often owners of llamas have little catch pens that they can sort of get them in with some food and then shut a gate so that they can get them in a smaller area. One thing we have noticed is that if lambs are born into a flock with a guardian llama, they are going to bond more closely than their parents did to the llama. So it, this only gets better with time. So briefly, how do you take care of a llama? Um, I really advise that you get a really good llama care book if you decide to go this route and you consult with someone who's experienced because um, there's a lot more to taking care of it than I can tell you in a couple of minutes. Um, food. They do best on arid pastures because that's what their home light, life land is like in the high Andes. They don't do well on alfalfa hay or high protein or really lush pastures. They cannot lick hard salt blocks, so they need loose salt and they need a llama mineral mix. And you, a lot of people have solved this situation by sort of building a higher um, salt and mineral feeder that the sheep can't reach or your goats can't reach so that they can get theirs. Uh, they can live outdoors as long as they have a shelter that provides shade and cover from rain or snow. They are susceptible to really cold temperatures below 15 degrees and um, they do need a warm shelter then if it would be unusually and extremely cold. People will use a heat lamp, make sure they're offering the llama warm water. They also suffer from heat stress, especially in really extreme heat or humidity. And people have different ways of trying to make the llama more comfortable. They can shear them like they would sheep in the spring, make sure they're offering shade, plenty of water. Some people use fans or misters in the area and they avoid transporting them during that kind of heat. Although a llama can jump about four and a half feet, they typically do not char challenge farm fencing at all, which makes them pretty easy to keep in. They can sometimes crawl underneath <laughs> something that's remarkably low, up to like 12 inches. So you might need to be a little careful about that. Um, the most tricky thing is that they will stick their heads through spaces in wire or field fencing or gates or livestock panels just out of curiosity and they can get stuck. Um, 
It's more dangerous if you're using non-electric wire or barbed wire or something that might be really dangerous to them. They have padded feet with large toenails and they need to be trimmed at least once a year, sometimes more. And just like with other animals, if the ground conditions are extremely wet, they could have some trouble with rain rot. Um, their teeth need to be floated perhaps when they get older, but the single interesting thing is here is that male llamas develop some sort of six or eight sort of sharp canines that are called fighting or wolf teeth. And it, they usually erupt between ages two and four, and most owners have their vet remove them so, or else they have them trimmed regularly. So that is something that you have to consider. Llamas don't groom each other, so they don't particularly like being brushed. It's not a social experience for them, like with your horse or something. Um, but their coat should be thoroughly groomed at least a couple of times a year if they have that short of short classic llama coat, they call it. Some llamas have medium to long fiber coats, in which case they're going to need a little bit more care. Um, Frequently, people shear them like they would an alpaca or a sheep or something. And, of course, they're going to need some veterinary care and, like, vaccinations and some parasite control. When you first bring home a llama, you need to be prepared before you bring it home with shelter and fencing, perhaps a catch pen. Um, the adjustment is going to take a few hours to several days, and the advice the best advice is to pen the llama with the stock in a small area for several days. This is more successful than just throwing them out in a big area with your animals. You want them to get used to each other in a smaller area. If your stock seems really upset, you can pen the llama next to them for a few days and sort of feed them a uh, you know, across and along a common fence line. So they start to get you used to each other and then move them into the small area. And you can repeat that a couple of times if you're trying to get everybody used to each other a little bit. Um, it's not good to give the llama too much attention during this time because you're, you want the llama to look to these animals as their new companions and herd mates. Be very careful the first year or so during your breeding season, maybe during your lambing or kidding season and stuff. Sometimes a, a really protective llama will try to herd the baby away from its mother because it's trying to protect it or something. Um, if you purchased a really younger llama, his guarding abilities may improve with some time. But if it's an older llama and you're not seeing that he's working out too well, that's probably not going to improve. Let's talk about donkeys. So donkeys are different from horses in several ways. Um, wild or feral donkeys usually live alone or in very small groups, not in large herds. And horses use those herds as protection. So as a result, donkeys are more self-protective and they are very territorial and they are more alert. They are using their senses of sight and smell and hearing, and they are more instinctively aggressive to natural predators than a horse um, because the horse would normally use its flight response, okay? So the donkey will be formidable when it's confronting a threat. It will bray loudly. It will bite, kick, slash, chase it. Uh, um, they can get very aggressive towards a predator. Female donkeys or jennies may actually exhibit more maternal protection of your flock and your sheep or other animals can start to see the donkey as their protector and go near them when they're alarmed. But I guess I have to be honest with you that the donkey, although they're accepting their herd mates, is probably not deliberately protecting them. It's probably protecting itself, essentially. The established advice is that a single donkey is more likely to socialize with your stock and if they're out with them and there are no other donkeys or equines with them. But some people have found success with two and they believe that two donkeys together can deal with threats better. So it's a possibility. So advantages of donkeys. Well, they are naturally aggressive to canines and usually bobcats That's uh, as well. They are very territorial and they will protect by default anything in their pasture. They do need a period of socialization that is longer than a llama, both the donkey to the stock and vice versa. And we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, they are easy to care for. They use similar shelters, fencing, and food as your stock in many cases. They don't challenge fencing. They don't dig. 
They're long lived, they're relatively inexpensive, although in some parts of North America, they can be harder to locate than in other parts. And sometimes I suggest to people that they look into the adopt a burrow program because those wild burrows have been gentled and they're looking for homes for them. And this usually works out pretty good. Um, they're not usually a threat to humans. Most domestic donkeys are docile, although they have that stubborn reputation that we all know about. Um, some can have a tendency to nip and it's just like with a horse. Don't hand feed it snacks and treats and things and, and you know, try to extinguish that behavior. Forceful punishment never works with a donkey. Calm insistence works best. And a lot of the techniques that we call natural horsemanship that we use um, to work with our horses also works with donkeys. And finally, the other big threat that we mentioned today, if you saw the ad, uh, they don't bark. They can, however, bray. <laughs> we'll mention that in a minute here. Um, they are also a prey animal, and this is also the biggest disadvantage. Even one canine can seriously injure a donkey. And multiple dogs or multiple coyotes or other large predators are uh, a serious danger to them. So you need to evaluate that. They are not usually protective against small predators, like we mentioned with llamas, things like weasels, raccoons, or large birds. And because of that, they're not quite as useful as a poultry protector. They may pay no attention to hawks, for instance, or something. Um, they can definitely pose a danger to your herding or pet dogs, especially if they are a very canine aggressive donkey. Some people use livestock guardian dogs with donkeys. And that's a situation that sometimes I think the dog has to be brought into and you have to sort of monitor how the donkey's doing with that. And you should expect it might not work. I know where it works wonderfully but you need to add great care if you bring one or the other together. Um, just don't assume that that's going to be easy to get going. Um, a donkey does not protect your family or your farm. And I think that's something, the same thing with a llama. And um, they may not even alert you to a potential problem that's going on in your farm. So you can't provide any kind of backup. Um, donkeys are less social than llamas. They don't really patrol. So they're not as effective when your sack is widely scattered, large pastures with dense vegetation or rough terrain. They are from arid homelands as well, and they are not adapted to extreme cold and wet conditions. So um, we're gonna talk a little bit in a minute how to handle that. They may harass your stock. Sometimes they're food aggressive with stock and you may need to feed them separately. Sometimes they interfere with birthing. The, the new baby may actually be seen as an intruder with the group. And so you have to be a little careful, monitor that first season a lot. And sometimes jennies that are in estrus also get sort of aggressive right there. And they can bray. <laughs> the best thing is not to reward braying, by the way. If you go and check on them or feed them or anything else, it's kind of like a dog. <laughs> You're conditioning them to bray more. So how do you select the donkey? The traits that are linked to their success are maturity, size, and the reaction to dogs. So maturity and size, you want them at least age three or so because they can be quite playful when they're young and they may uh, try to initiate play with your, your stock and injure them. Either a gilded Jenny, Jack, or a Jenny with a foal will both be really protective and will be safe to have with to handle rather than an intact Jack. Heavily pregnant Jennies may not be able to handle threats for a little while and they may favor their newborn over their stock, but it's a common thing for people to try to get a pregnant Jenny because that foal raised with those animals will be bonded very closely to them. And sometimes they turn out to be just really good livestock guardians. Um, and intact jocks, in, intact jacks are a danger to stock. They're more difficult to handle and um, it's something to avoid. Um, they should be standard size or larger, never miniature. Miniature donkeys are way too small to be handling predators. If possible, if you go to select one, see if you can test their reaction to a strange dog. Um, many of them don't respond to their owner's dogs because they've gotten used to them on the property. So you're, you're going to need to ask and then you're going to need to do this very carefully, but you wanna see if you get that sort of reaction to a dog. Some donkeys are socialized to all dogs and they aren't going to be protective. And the 
dog is a good indication of them being, you know, protective against um, coyotes and stuff. Um, you need to choose a healthy and a sound animal. And just like with the llamas, if you don't know anything about these animals, it's really good if you can enlist a friend or somebody who's knowledgeable to go with you and help check out, you know, whether this is a good, easy animal to handle, whether it seems healthy. You could even have a vet check. Um, make sure you can catch and handle and lead the donkey. And again, this is a place where you might arrange for a couple of private lessons if you haven't handled one before. Some people will sometimes advise that you um, get an entirely wild or feral donkey because it will be very protective. But that is going to be not only a threat to you when you're out working your stock and trying to move them, but it's going to be impossible to provide that donkey with the care that it needs. Um, as I said before, the Bureau of Land Management adopt a donkey. Those donkeys are always gentled before they're adopted out to the public. And briefly, guardian donkey care, just to give you an idea of what they need. Um, they're not ruminants, obviously. They're native to arid and coarse pasture. So you have to be careful not to overfeed them. Um, so lush pastures, rich grasses, rich hay, grains, all those things can cause founder or colic there. The, keeping them at a good weight and on proper diet will go a long way. Um, they need salt mineral blocks for equines rather than maybe if you have sheep, you're using the plain white ones. Um, so they're going to need their own salt. They need shelter from rain and wind and cold and snow and wet ground because they lack the protective undercoat that a horse develops during the winter. They do grow a longer winter coat, but they don't have quite the resistance to cold that we see in horses. Um, fences usually aren't a problem. Whatever's keeping in your cattle or your horses or something else will work fine for them. Their hooves are more durable than horses in most cases. They still need to be trimmed every couple of months or so. Um, when they get older, their teeth may need to be floated like you do with a, another, with a horse. In the spring, their winter coat may need some attention. If it's picked up a lot of mud or mats and the weather's starting to turn warm, in really hot areas, people will clip them like they would clip a horse. And that's something you may need to do. If it's really cold weather and your donkey has a lot of dried mud on it or debris or something, grooming that out will keep them warmer. So you need to pay attention to their coat. And finally, their medical care is um, very similar to horses, the same type of uh, vaccinations and parasite control. So bringing a donkey home. Plan on this taking about four to six weeks. Be prepared with the shelter and the fencing and think about where you might be able to um, start looking around for a farrier so you're not presented with this problem, of not being able to find one. Um, the four to six weeks is sort of a minimum. It can take up to maybe six months, depending on your stock and your donkey. Um, at first, you should put the donkey in a separate pen next to your stock and try to keep it away from any other equines you might have on your property. Um, feed the stock and the donkey along a common fence line. Take lots of time for everybody adjust to adjust to each other. Don't rush. And then very carefully, when you see that there seem to be socializing through the fence some, what um, release them in a small area with some stock and observe what's going on. Now, too small of an area causes a lot of stress, like inside a barn or a really small paddock. So you need to have a small enough area that they can't totally avoid each other, or, but not such a small area that the whole thing seems stressful to them. Begin to, if things are going well, you can begin increasing their time together. I wouldn't recommend that you leave them alone for a while, like when you're at night or when you're going to be away from home, unless things are going really swimmingly. <laughs> If it's needed, you can step back and repeat this whole process and do the socialization again. There is also an alternative method. If you've tried a couple of times to get them to socialize with each other this way and get used to each other, you can try this alternative method. What you do is you take the donkey and you put it somewhere sort of in isolation for all other, from all other animals for a week or two. You can visit the donkey and handle the donkey and stuff like that, but you kind of want him to want some company. When you release them together, then sometimes they're really grateful to be out with somebody. Um, keep an eye out for food aggression 
and you may need to feed them separately if there's a high value food like a grain or put the donkey somewhere else when you're graining your stock. Um, again, supervise birthing and breeding periods for a year or so. Keep an eye on the donkey to see how it's doing. Um, the most common problems that are reported are, you know, sort of aggression to the stock or that they just aren't working. Now we're going to talk briefly about livestock guardian dogs because we're going to talk about even more about them in depth in the coming weeks here. Livestock guardian dogs are specific breeds of dogs. It's not a job description. And they were developed by sheep and goat cultures that kept animals, moved them to high pastures in the summer, maybe in the mountains, or they were migratory people. So they were selected to have a set of specific traits. They have very little or no prey or chase drive. And uh, if you ever have owned an L a livestock guard dog, you know they are not good at playing fetch with balls. <laughs> they just don't have these behaviors. If they do play or chase some as a young dog, it needs to be stopped. And in their homelands, it would have been stopped by older dogs or by the shepherd. Their activity level is low, especially compared to herding dogs. They spend a lot of time just chilling out. Um, they are capable of actually bonding to your stock. They can be very nurturing. They prefer to be with them. They patrol and they mark and they bark to warn off threats. They display steps of defensive protection or aggression. They start by barking and then they start bluffing, maybe making some charges towards the predator. And those steps are, um, are not something that you have to train. This is instinctive in them. They all have a similar appearance that says, I am not a wolf to sheep. <laughs> they all have drop ears. They have curly tails, although some may be bobbed. They are large. They are often the color of sheep or a color that shepherds preferred because they could see the dog out with the sheep. They have big duff, uh, double coats so that they're warm enough to stay outside year round. The advantages of livestock guard dogs are that they can are the most versatile and successful livestock guardian dog by far. They can be used with just about any um, stock that you can you know, you might need from poultry and sheep to goats to cattle, young pigs. I know livestock guardian dogs who are guarding vineyards from deer. They are being used to protect sled dogs and sled dog yards. They can guard against all sorts of predators, including birds of prey. Um, they they can exhibit strong nurturing behaviors. They will alert you to something wrong frequently with your animals. They patrol and they mark and they speak dog language to coyotes and other predators. And this works terrifically at keeping things off of your property. They can work on very large and rough terrain. They can work in pairs or packs if you need larger numbers to combat a big predator threat. They also protect your farm and your family. They alert you to the threat and owners learn very rapidly how to uh, interpret that barking from just this barking that's letting a predator know that they're out there to warning them off to this actual confrontation when you know that maybe you better step out and see what's going on. And they do all this without direction from you. Disadvantages. They are expensive, especially if they're a well-bred and carefully selected dog whose parents have been medically screened and they are slow to mature unless you buy an adult dog. Um, they need socialization and supervision when they were young for a year or two, depending on the dog. Traditionally, it was done by the full-time shepherd and the older mentor dogs. Our situations are frequently different, so we have to do some different things in raising a, a livestock guard dog. Their heritage is from huge open spaces. So they do not boundary train. They have a strong urge to patrol outward. Two or three miles is nothing for them. It's not normal for them to be contained in small areas. So you are going to need good fencing and they need to learn to respect fencing when they are very young. They are not friendly to your landscaping. They will dig dens. They will dig under fences. Um, they will bark, especially at night. And barking is part of how they work. Um, it lessens with maturity and as they get confidence. But if you have lots of close neighbors, this barking may be a, a tremendous disadvantage for you and your neighbors might really object to it. They need dog food and different care than the stock. They are self-thinkers in terms of they don't always do what you want them to do. They're not biddable like a herding dog. Um, 
if you are not comfortable with a large protective dog, that can also be a disadvantage. You might not feel comfortable having them. They can be aggressive to strangers or strange workers on your property. So you need to think how you're going to keep them apart from these from people that might be on your property. And they may be aggressive to other dogs. Um, they usually come to ex to accept your your herding dog and your family dogs, but they shouldn't be out with them when they're um, when you're not with them and supervising things. How to select? We're going to very briefly do this because I'm going to talk more specifically about how to do this later. There are three traits that make a livestock guardian dog essential, successful. They're attentive and protective and they're trustworthy. And the breeder selects for these traits. So you need to buy a livestock guardian dog breed or a cross between livestock guardian dog breeds, not something else, because you want them to get these inherited temperaments and behaviors. In our next session, we're going to talk about how to select a puppy, how to select a rescue dog, how to select an adult. Um, and those things are very specific. I'm going to give you some good tips for that. You need to think about your own specific needs. If you have an immediate threat, you may need an adult dog right now. Do you have large, dangerous predators? What type of stock and animals do you have? Your husbandry style. There are a lot of things to consider, and we're going to go into depth on all this stuff in the next session. Um, briefly, and we've sort of addressed all this, they need food that's going to be different from your stock. Um, they need shelter. If for the most part, they like to sleep with their animals, but your local regulations may require you to have a shelter available for them. Fencing is tremendously important. Um, roaming or being hit by a car or being shot is the greatest cause of death to a livestock guardian dog under the age of two. Um, this is going to be something that you're going to have to pay attention to. Um, their coat, a good coat, doesn't mat, doesn't need a lot of care because the dried mud falls off. Your dog may have inherited a bad coat, especially if the breeder did not pay a lot of attention to it, and they may need more, um, it, it may need more attention. Finally, you need to handle your livestock guardian dog. You need to train them to walk on a leash, accept being tethered, put in a kennel area or a stall or something, maybe riding in a car if you're going to have to go to the vet if you don't have farm calls. So very definitely you're going to have to do some handling. And just briefly, because we're going to go into this in depth more as well. Before you bring home either a puppy or an adult, make sure you have a safe place to keep them. And it needs to be near the stock from the very beginning. Not on your porch, not in your house, not even for one night, or you are going to have a porch dog or a house dog. Um, they may cry like a puppy in a crate would cry in your house, but it's only going to last for a couple of days. Give them lots of attention where they're going to live and work. All the people that are going to be working with you on your farm, adults, children, they need to know all those people. Do not rush all these introductions to your other dogs. Take time, days, weeks before you start letting them interact. And I strongly advise that you don't let them play with your pet dogs or your neighbor dogs. You want them to protect your stock against dogs. And finally, just like with other animals, the first time they see birthing or breeding or you're introducing new stock, you need to be careful. So I think we're wrapping up on time here. In two weeks, we're doing part two, what we're calling part two, a deeper dive. And we are going to be very specific and talk about breeds. We're going to talk about cross breeds. We're going to talk about how to find a good dog, whether it's a puppy, an adult, or a potential rescue, uh, how to find a breeder, how to select a puppy or an adult dog, um, how to bring them home, whether they're an, a puppy or an adult, and the different ways you can approach this training and supervision that you're going to have to do. And then finally, in part three, we're calling it troubleshooting because we're going to really focus on a lot of these adolescent behavior issues that may crop up. And we're going to learn how to read their physical body language a little bit, both good and bad, how to introduce new dogs, um, either to work with them as livestock guard dogs or other herding dogs or something. And we're going to talk about poultry guarding because that is a really big deal. Finally, um, everything that I've talked about, um, there are lots of articles and posts on my website and you can go read about it a little bit more in depth. I also have links to a lot of outstanding resources by other people um, 
who work with these animals. And I'm, if you have an urgent question or a personal question, I'm really going to um, suggest that you think about joining the Facebook group, if you can, called Learning About LGDs. I'm a member there, and there are lots of experienced folks, and they will help you problem solve. And like I said before, this is very much a we're all learning together and thinking about it. So especially if you have a, a question right now, that might be a good way to go. You can also contact me through my website. And I think we're about done, Larissa. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jan. Yeah, you got through everything. I'm just I know. <laughs> um, Jan shared with me that she used to be a she's a retired school um, uh, middle school teacher, so she yeah. is <laughs> she's good at these things. So um, we do have some time for your questions. If folks have questions, I'm going to encourage you to type into the chat bar on the left side of your screen to submit, and then we're going to read them aloud and, and perhaps um, consolidate some if they're similar questions, and then Jan will will respond. Um, so. Yeah, I do see. I see one question that came in, Jan, that asked, mm -hmm. and I'll just get you started. Um, yeah. Start. Yeah. It's um, do donkeys need to to be exercised regularly? No, both donkeys and llamas are going to be content living in the same area as your stock. And a livestock guardian dog. Well, a puppy has a lot of extra energy and may need some big romps and things and pastures, even as an adult. If they're in a decent to bonus space, have bigger acres, the smallest, much larger, larger, they're going to exercise themselves as well, too. Okay, great. Thanks for that. And I, I'm just going to say that your um, audio got a little bit buzzy just now, just so you, I don't know if it's the okay. connect, connection to the the um, speaker or whatnot, but um, yeah, <laughs> uh, but you know, we did get through the main pre presentation, so. <laughs> uh, no, it still sounds like it's kind of like um, auto, what did they, what's that? thing that they they do to all the new songs now um oh, dear, dear. <laughs> um let's see oh i see oh, my question that i can answer here can you hear me good enough to tell me to do this um how do dog dogs respond to an intense rotational grazing plan really well lots of people train them to work with electro and they are moved with their stock stock from pasture to pasture and from area to area so that works out well Excellent. Okay. Um, Any success using donkeys or llamas with poultry? Um, they will be useful just as a larger animal in the area. Like sometimes my sheep are out with my chickens, and the very fact that my sheep are there probably discourage some predators, but they're not like a livestock guardian dog that will be alert to hawks or um, other you know, aerial threats in particular, you know, so um, they are not as successful at all. By the way, Jan, your, your uh, connection is much better with okay, that I last didn't... question. All right. <laughs> I, I know. You don't... Mm. All right. Uh, any, any last questions for Jan for this presentation? I know people might be holding off because, oh, there's a couple that came in. Uh, how well do dogs work with dairy cattle? They work with all cattle. Increasingly, we're seeing the livestock guardian dogs with beef cattle. Um, dairy cattle being moved around in the barn, this is something they'll probably have to get used to, but a lot of people keep milk cows on a small farm. They're doing remarkably well with cattle, um, more than, I, than their original some livestock guardian dogs originally were kept with people who did have cattle, most with sheep or goats. So I'm always have been so surprised at how they become adaptable to these things. It's just like poultry. That was never their job. They figure out kind of how to do it too, although it takes some support from us. Um, what are your thoughts on keeping litter mates? I am opposed to keeping litter mates unless they are going to be totally separated. Um, the litter mate syndrome is a real thing. If you Google it, you will find tons of dog behaviorists who have talked about it. They tend to fight more as adults 
probably because they're trying to establish dominance even more so than we would see with other dogs. Um, I know some people have success with it and they advocate it, but especially two females, I would never keep maybe a female and a male and have them neutered and fixed. Uh, that would be all right. But if you try to raise two puppies at the same time, the problem can be that they bond more to each other than the stock. And it's sort of the same thing that we saw with donkeys and llamas and stuff. You want their focus to be on the stock, not each other. Uh, my puppies spend their night in the sheep pen, but during the day they hung around the chickens. If I would not let them around your house. <laughs> I'm, I'm really a hard hearted person about this. Um, dogs like being like people. And if you want them out protecting your sheep and your chickens, that's where they need to be. And if they're in your yard, they're also going to be more of a problem with strangers or visitors as they get mature and they get far more protective. Oh, somebody's talking about having um, educational material. Where livestock guard dogs are used with sheep or goats in the West on open grazing or public land, they do have informational sort of flyers that they pass out um, to help let people know that they're in the area, what to do if they encounter them. Um, you can search for that. I'm trying to think. I think that we probably have some of them over at learning about livestock, learning about LGDs. I'm going to try to put links to a couple of those things up on my website tomorrow. I'll do that because that's a useful thing. There's also people have made really nice little one page flyers explaining what their guardian animal is doing out in their field with their animals and pass them out to their neighbors too, to just give them an idea of why this donkey's out there or this llama or the dog. And If you, if somebody's talking about multiple uh, moving dogs around between different kinds of animals, you have to give them all those experiences when they're young, move them around, be flexible, change things up, and they should adapt to everything. Many large producers with lots of sheep and lots of cattle and stuff move the animals back and forth between different things. Uh, how old do you think an LGD needs to be before it can effectively deter foxes or coyotes? Um, some dogs will start real showing their stuff around a year or 18 months. Some dogs are sort of slow developers and it might be two years at the far end. Uh, somebody wants to know about my website. It's jandonor.com. I think we have that up on our information thing. Yes, and I'll be sending that link and then the, the Facebook uh, group link as well in a follow-up email for to make it easy for folks to find. How, do you have time for one more question? Yeah, let's do let's okay. do two more questions. How, if we have how tall does the fence need to be for a livestock guard dog? Um, some of it has to do with how you can beef it up. Um, ex, you know, the typical sort of drift fencing that we use with cattle or horses, like, you know, three strands of wire or really open um, netting or something, that's not going to keep in a dog, but you can beef it up with a lot with some electricity um it's electric lines and you can teach a puppy by the time they're four months old to avoid a hot wire you can put it on the top of a fence that's too short if your fencing's maybe only 48 inches you could put a strand or two of electric wire on top some people put a scare wire of electric wire down low to keep them from getting up close to the fence to dig so there are ways to sort of beef up the fencing that you have Lots of people are finding success using invisible fencing as a backup to a real physical fence. I would never advise using invisible fencing alone. These dogs are far too protective that they would blow through that if they thought they were confronting a threat and um, it wouldn't stop them. But many of us, myself included, have strung invisible fence wire, which you can buy in bulk, just, you know, twist tied it or <laughs> clipped it to our existing fencing and put the collar on the dog and starting at a young age again, four or five months. And they learned so rapidly, my dogs never needed to have, once they had learned that this fence bites just like an electric fence, um, they, they just, they were very responsive to a warning beep 
and they would just stay away from it. And they, matter of fact, as they got older, were wearing their collars very loosely, <laughs> just so it would beep if they got near the fence. Um, so the biggest question is making sure when they're a puppy, they and a young dog, they do not escape because escaping is self-rewarding and they will keep doing it. If you're really good about your fencing and keeping them in the first year of their life, you usually have got it licked. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I actually, I see a couple more questions about um, breed preferences and kind of, uh, but yeah. we'll probably get into that next time. Yes, we are definitely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I'm going to, let's see, I just have a few housekeeping, let me just back this up, um, items before we sign off. Like I mentioned, immediately following the webinar, um, you're going to be asked to complete a very, very, very brief survey. We'd greatly appreciate it if you take a minute to tell us about your experience. Also, um, a recording of this webinar and the slides will be available soon. The documents will be archived on our website, and I'm also going to email them to all of you tomorrow, along with several of those links that were mentioned um, during the webinar. Just so you know that we do have quite a few webinars coming up. Some of them were mentioned um, already, but next week we are going to have one about our Fund to Farmer grants. Uh, you're invited to join us to learn about the application process that is currently underway. We'll discuss the three types of grants that are available, tips for applying online, and ideas um, for how you can submit a strong application. Applications are due on November 28th and the grants will be awarded early uh, winter 2019. So uh, I believe that's all the time we have for today. Uh, a sincere thank you to you, Jan, for your fantastic presentation and for taking the time to answer all of our questions. Um, thank you to all of our audience members for your continued attention and your interest. And I hope that everyone has a very wonderful evening and that we're able to connect again soon. Goodbye. <laughs>